We're beginning a new book of Shemos and the Parsha of Shemos. Okay, 292. It begins, Ve'elish Shemos Bnei Yisrael that's right. So the, the sentence begins with very poor grammar. It says, mm-hmm. and these are the names of the, of the children of Israel who went down to Egypt. So uh, the, the commentaries want to know why does the, it begin with a and? Right? You, don't, you, don't believe, you don't begin a sentence with and. You don't begin a paragraph with and. You don't begin a story with and. You don't begin a book with and. So why are you starting that? So um, just to begin with that idea, so the, the commentaries have all different answers for it. But uh, basically the idea is that it's alluding to the fact that it's directly tied in to what we just finished. What happened at the end? The last thing we read about was that Yosef was put into a casket. He dies, and he's put into a casket, and he gets the, the Jewish people promise, he get, tells his brothers, that, that they have to take him out of Egypt uh, when they go back to Israel. Because it's already known that they're going to be in Egypt, they're, they have to go to Egypt, and then they're going to go back to Israel. That's a known fact, right? That was told to Abraham. So he tells them that, right? And then it says, and these are the names of the Jewish people who came down to Egypt meaning that there's a direct correlation. And the correlation is is that when we, be, we end the last week's Parsha, it seems to be a very strange place to add it. Because we added it at a place that it's sort of like a cliffhanger, like on these Batman television shows, where you know at the end the guy's about to kill someone and it ends. Here Yosef dies, right? And he's not even buried. And it just ends. Right? It's like all of these people die, and, and Yaakov dies in that Parsha, and then Yosef dies in that Parsha, and it's an end of an era. We understand that. But, but, it, but there's no conclusion. Let it have finished at the end of Yaakov's life. Yosef's the next generation. We could start this week talking about a little bit with Yosef, then Yosef dies, and it goes into the next part. But um, the fact that it ends at that point is that they're, 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 giving, they're sending you a message. They're sending a, a message that, that we should understand why it ended at that point and then why it begins with the word and at this point. Um, I guess I can, uh, I, I once explained this by telling a story about Alexander. Did I mention that last week, the story about Ale- King Alexander the Great? Mm-hmm. He was the, he- right, the head of Macedonia. He, he ran the empire, right, the Greek empire. And so here Alexander the Great, it says that he went, um, and before he would go on war, especially the war he was about to go on with the stories from, uh, which was to take over Asia, he would go on, and all of his soldiers, he would give them money from the treasury to give to their families. So, because there's going to be nobody there to support the families while they're gone to war, right? And they also might not come back from war. So the families are all nervous. Maybe my husband is going to war, he won't come back. Maybe my husband's going to war, but he'll come back. But who's going to feed us for the next six months while he's fighting a war, or two years while he's fighting a war? Like, what's going to happen to us? So that everybody should be secure and they shouldn't be afraid their husband's going to die and they'll be, be without food. So the king, Alexander, took the money from his treasury and he gave it out to all of the people so that the people shouldn't be worried. Um, and, that, and that was his feeling. So it says that, um, that his general, um, Potiphius, I think his name was, came to him and said to him, you know, sir, you've given out the entire treasury and there's nothing for you. There's nothing for your family. What are, you going to do? what are you going to have for them? So he says, I have for them hope. They have hope that, they're, that, hope that we're going to win the war, we're going to be successful, we're going to take over all this land, we're going to replenish the treasury, and, we're going to, and, and I'm going to come back. And so the general tells that to the men, and the men decide they're all giving the money back because they also believe that hope is really what they need and they don't need the money. And by taking the money, it shows that they don't have hope. So they went and they put all the money back in the treasury and they all fought the war. The point is the same thing here. Yosef ends, and it ends with the death of Yosef. And Yosef says, take me with you back to Egypt. We don't know, I mean back to Israel, we don't know what's about to happen in, in Egypt. That we go from, in the days of Yosef, where the Jews are heroes. Right? They're brought, they're, they saved the Egyptian culture. Mm-hmm. Right? They're heroes. They go from being heroes to neighbors, to people, to unwanted guests, to slavery. Mm-hmm. They, they don't know that at this point. And, 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 and that they're going to feel that they're lost, that God has given up on them. He's not taking them out of, Israel, out of Egypt. They're going to be there forever. They're going to be slaves, and their children will be slaves, and their children will be slaves, and all hope will be lost. So the Parsha ends there with the statement 
that Yosef says, you will take me out with you when you leave Egypt. Um, and they agreed to it, is that was giving them hope. That they knew that they were coming out. That no matter what happens, we don't know what's going to happen to us, but even if we will become slaves in Egypt, we're still going to come out. Right? Because, because Yosef told us we're going to go out and we have to take him with us. So when we begin this parsha with the Vav, it's to include that message. Because about right now, we're about to enter into a very sad part of the history of the Jewish people, which is the slavery, the intense, intense slavery, which is almost beyond our capability to understand how horrible it was for 240 years. It's a long time. That's, you know, that means you, know, you have great-great-grandchildren born into slavery. You're a slave and your great-great-grandchildren are slaves. Imagine how long that is. So here you see that, that um, they put the Vav in to remind you that even though we're about to enter that, there is hope that the future is going to change, and we will, and we find that out in a few weeks. Right? But that's why it starts that way. So, um, and then it tells us a few lines later that um, the, um, it says Viyamas Yosef Yosef dies, Vichal Achav Vichal Edarhu, and all of his brothers died, and the entire generation died. Um, and it tells us that the Jewish people in Israel Faru Verishasu Yirbu. The Jewish people they were fruitful. They increased. The word Sheretz means like a bug, you know, bugs can have a hundred children at one time, you know how they, they just like mass produce, you have one worm and then you have a million worms, so the Jewish people were fruitful and they increased greatly by Yerbu and they increased, by Yatsmun became strong and they filled the land so the Jewish, there were a lot of Jews, right originally there were only 70, right, now there's a whole nation of people, Jewish people living in Egypt, the Torah tells us, and then it begins the story, Vayakam Melech Hadash now there's a new king, Al Mitzrayim there's a new pharaoh in Egypt, right a new boss in town Shalom Yadas Yosef. He doesn't know Yosef. Yosef died. He doesn't know him. Now there's an argument in the commentaries. Does that mean that the Pharaoh that we knew before dies, and this is a new person? That's literally what it says. Or is it the same one? But now that Yosef's gone, it's what have you done for me lately? You know, he doesn't care anymore. Yosef's not here. I don't owe him anything anymore. The fact that he saved our country, that that's 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 old ancient history. Now they've got these Jewish people and they're a problem. So the commentaries go both ways, that it could be the same one, it's a different one, but it's certainly a different attitude. It I, changes. I always thought it was a, a new dynasty. Around. Well, it says that literally. Yes. The commentaries so hint to the fact that it may anything, not be. They didn't have anything to do with whatever pleased the old dynasty. Right. So he says now, Mahabov and Yichwachmalo, he says, let, let us be smart. Let's be wise. We got these Jewish people here. There's a lot of them. Right? But you know that before there were 70 now there's thousands and thousands of Jewish people living in our land and you know what, we can't be stupid with these Jewish people, we got to be smart about them, because they're going to take us over, and he says he says that if we're going to go to war and they're going to go and join the side of our enemies and they'll fight with us and they'll leave in other words, Pharaoh says these are like it's like, you know, you have an enemy living among you. You have these Jewish people living in our country, and as soon as somebody goes to war with us, we're going to have uh, uh, enemies within our country fighting against us together with our enemy. Right? They're going to side with our enemies, and the Jewish people will overthrow us and take over the country, and then they're going to leave. Right? So the, the fact is that Pharaoh is, uh, you know, he's, he's setting them up, right? that there's a, a problem with them. So he, go, he makes them into slaves. Right? That's what he does. He takes away their freedom so that they can't do this. Right? That's the whole idea. But, but the idea that you know he thought that there were so many Jews. I mean, there was a great increase in the number of Jews. But this is a... Um, one of my, my teachers taught me a very interesting point. And this is really a, 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 an early sign of sort of subtle anti-Semitism. For instance, he was, uh, Me he was from South America and he used to live in Mexico for a while. So he used to tell me the story. He says, if you go into Mexico City, the largest city in the world, there's millions and millions and millions of people there. And you go, you go there and you go into Mexico City and you meet a cab driver. And you say to the cab driver, you say, Jose, how many Jewish people are there in Mexico City? And he'll say, oh, senor, there are so many Jewish people here. My, the man who owns my cab, sir, he's Jewish man owns my apartment building, he is Jewish, my lawyer, he is Jewish, my accountant is Jewish, there are so many Jewish people here. Like, now, the fact is, there's less than 1% of Mexico City was Jewish. Like, it's a very, very small, minute group that are Jewish. But it's true that he interacted with many people, this taxi driver, who were Jews, because they were in the areas of power 
right, where he, he was working for a cab company, the owner was Jewish. He lived in an apartment building, the owner was Jewish. He needed a lawyer, the lawyer was Jewish, the accountant's Jewish. So he thinks everyone's Jewish, when in reality there's very few Jews. Right? But the point was is that by seeing all these Jews in, in positions of power can frighten someone. You can say, wait a minute, if these Jews get upset with us, they're going to they're gonna go to war, they're going to destroy us. They're in all the positions of power. So it's like they're everywhere. Like everywhere I look, there's Jews. Now that's exactly what, the, what Faro said. And he said, therefore, we can't have that. But what we see is an interesting point. Up until this point in history, the Jewish people lived in Goshen. Goshen was a, a part, uh, there was a part of Egypt that was given to the Jews by Pharaoh through the request of Yosef, where they could live in their own community. Jews living with Jews. They could cohabitate with non-Jews, they could live among non with non-Jews, but their neighborhood was a Jewish neighborhood. That's where they lived. What the Parsha is telling us here is the Jewish people started to leave there and started to become a part of Egyptian society because they were so powerful and wealthy and there were so many of them, they started moving into the Egyptian neighborhoods. And the Egyptians were not so happy about that, that you have these Jews living among us. And the Jews are, are successful and they're making money and they've got you know, nice cars and nice houses and look at us and we work so hard and this is our country and they're strangers and they're doing better than us. That started to cause all of this negative feeling. So the, 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 what's interesting enough is that many people will say that causes of our anti-Semitism is because Jews are openly Jewish. Right? When you see like a Hasidic Jew, people will say, oh, you know, they cause anti-Semitism because they look so different and they act different. When in reality, this, 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 the Torah here shows us that anti-Semitism did not come through Jews being Jewish. It came through Jews assimilating. When the Jews started to assimilate and move into the parts of the country that were not Jewish parts of the country and to start becoming like non-Jews but being Jewish um, and living where they live, the non-Jews became bothered by it. So that caused the anti-Semitism. As long as the Jews stayed where the Jews lived, they lived among themselves. They were different. They were odd, perhaps, but they weren't a threat to us. Now, because they're living with us, they're going to the circuses with us. They're going to the movies with us. They're going to everywhere we go, right? Are they play? Are their kids play with our kids? They're starting to marry into our families. We, we better watch out because they're going to take over. Right? That's that showed you a, a, a very interesting point of of how the Torah tells us that anti-Semitism. One of the ways of anti-Semitism happens. But but um, Pharaoh actually had another alternative. And that was to say, okay, boys, you came down because there was a famine in the land. Those days are over. Isn't it time to go back? Right, right. except the Egyptians did have their understanding that they were benefiting. Right? Right. The Jews are making money. Mm -hmm. And when you make money, you pay taxes. Mm -hmm. right? okay. They knew that. Right? You have that. That's why it says, if you look closely at his words, he says they're going to side with their enemies and they're going to leave. And so what? Let them leave, right? Yeah. Let them leave. Then we don't have a problem. Is it, and he said, no, no, no. If they, right, if they, if we let, if they leave, they're leaving with everything. They're taking all our money, right? We can't let them do that, right? We need them. They're, we have a brain drain. We have to have them, but we have to have them at our the way we want them, not the way they want to be. That was his point. So now what happens here? It sort of changes now and gets into a specific story, um, where you know the king. Uh, this is where we now have Pharaoh. Right, enslavens the Jews and they, he wants to put a punishment upon the Jews and that, that they shouldn't have more children because then there'll be more of them, specifically boys, because the boys are the ones who go to war. Right. So if you look even in the, in the English, beginning with uh, verse 15, it says, The king of Egypt says to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of the first was Shifra and the name of the second was Pua, and he said, When you deliver the Hebrew women and you see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you are to kill him, and if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do so, as the king of Egypt spoke to them, and they caused the boys to live. Okay, so here, this is a, this is a, a very interesting point, part of the Torah. There are many things to say about this, but I'll show you something that, that is, is radically different than most. You see here, it says that the king goes to the Hebrew midwives. He tells you who they are. Right? They are actually the mother and sister of Moshe. That's who they are. They have different names here. We'll explain that in a minute. Um, and he says to them, when the women are sitting on the birth stool, that means they're about to give birth, right? When, they're, when the women are giving birth. So as they're, about, uh, as they're giving birth, right, if it's a boy, kill it. If it's a girl, you can let her live, right? Now it says the midwives feared God, right? They weren't going to kill people. So they didn't do what the king wanted, and they let the boys to live, right? They didn't kill them. Now, the next start, now let's go on. The king of Egypt summons the midwives, right? He sees the boys are living. Right? The king sees no one's killing any baby boys. So he calls the midwives. He says, what have you done? 
you let the boys live. So the midwives answer him. Listen to this answer. He's, they say to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are unlike the Egyptian women, for they are experts. Before the midwife comes to them, they have given birth. Right? God benefited the midwives and so forth. So their answer to him is, they gave birth before we got there. Right? In other words, they sat on the birth stool, they gave birth, we showed up, it was too late. The babies are born, how can we kill them? So what, how does that answer the question? The guy, he says to them, when the women are giving birth, if, the boy, if it's born and it's a boy, kill him. Okay? Then they say, well, we couldn't do it, because when we got there, the babies were already born. So the baby's already born, what are you supposed to do? But Kill him. It can happen sometimes, but in uh, all the cases, the king is going to believe that. Every time a baby's born... Right, but let's say were... it's true, but they didn't answer the question. Because why didn't you kill him? All he said was, all they answered was, was that we weren't there at the birth, we came in after the birth. So we come in after birth and there's the baby boy. So what would the king want them to do? Kill him. Right? Because they said the women are delivering babies. When they deliver the boy, kill him. So they come in and say, well, they delivered him an hour ago. So is it a boy? Kill him. Why didn't you do what I told you? It doesn't answer the question. See the point? Do you see what I mean? It doesn't answer it. And, and, and my teacher, Owen Lesky, was very clear that it's because we're not reading this correctly. The word birth stool is not a birth stool, he said. He says the birth stool leads you to believe that the that 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 you know what happens it's like today a woman goes into labor she goes to the hospital and they put her in a position to give birth they call the midwife or they call the doctor and she gives birth right they being in that position to give birth that's the birth stool there they had a stool here we have a bed right that's what it seems like he says that can't be because their answer doesn't make sense because if it's the birth stool and the women come and they give birth and it's a boy they kill him so if the woman come and she just gave birth and it's a boy they should kill him how does that answer the pharaoh that they didn't kill him so the answer is that this word in, in the, here is called the, the avanim, avanayim, is not a birth stool. He says that this was a tool that the women had in those days that they could tell if the woman was going to give birth to a boy or a girl. They, like, like today, doctors can use ultrasound and they can tell if it's going to be a boy or a girl. Back then, they had a tool, however that tool worked, that could gave them the information if this woman was pregnant that she was going to give birth to a boy or a girl. They could tell. It was sometime near the delivery, but they could use this tool and they would know. Now, if we, if we understand the word, that, that this word is not birthing stool, but it's actually this instrument, let's read it again. Now, the so king of Egypt goes to the mid, mid, Hebrew midwives. Right? The first one's name is Shifra, the second one is Pua. And he says, when you deliver the Hebrew women and you see using this tool that it's a boy, you should kill him. And if it's a girl, you should let her live. But the midwives feared God, and they didn't do it, and they let the boys live. The king of Egypt calls them back and says, what did you do? You let them live. So they said, what do you know? We didn't let them live. The, women, the Hebrew women are strong. So before we got there, it says, right, before the midwife comes to them, they gave birth. We couldn't use the tool. We couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl. Basically, what Pharaoh was saying, I don't want you to murder boys. I want you to, to commit an, an, an act of abortion on boys. Now, if the boy's born, it's too late. I can't, I can't tell you to kill a human being. But this baby inside of the mother, that's not a person yet. You can abort him. So use this tool. Find out if it's a boy or a girl. If it's a boy, kill him. Inside the womb. Abort it. Right? Kill the baby. Right? And so they said, well, we couldn't. Because by the time we got there to use the tool, the Jewish women gave birth already. The baby's born. And we're not allowed to kill a baby. You can kill it. Abortion's one thing. But you didn't want us to kill a baby. Right? And suddenly now it makes sense, right? That made sense. That that's now you, their answer fits in. The way we read it otherwise doesn't fit in. You see the difference? It's, now I think it's correct. I mean, not everyone agrees with him, but I think that's correct because otherwise it doesn't work. Now we mentioned about the name Shifra and Pua. It's a famous um, comment, but it's a very interesting comment. If you look at Rashi, he says, "Why are these two women? Why are we told their names? And why do we never hear of these names again?" Right, these, these are the two names. Right, we, today we know of women named Shifra. There were some women named Pua, but you don't have that much anymore. Um, and it says here that um, that Rashi is quoted. That if we look at the Rashi, it says Shifra. Right, the name Shifra. What, what does this mean? Zu Yocheved. This was Yocheved. Yocheved is the mother of Moshe and Aaron. Al Shem Shem Beferes Es Avlad. It says that that she used to make the baby pretty. Now, the baby's born, they're pretty ugly. They're covered with blood and gook, right? And the mother would see them like that, 
So the, ba- the mother, the, this, this midwife, before she let the mother see the baby, she'd wash him off and make him ha- look good. So the mother would see the beautiful baby. Right? That's why she's called Shifra, because she made the baby sh- Shifra Ferris, so she made him pretty. And then it says Pua. Why is the woman called? Well, who is Pua? The zoo Miriam. Miriam. This is the older sister of Moshe and Aaron, the daughter of Yehovah. And and it says Al Shame. Why is she called Pua? Al Shame Shua Pua v'medaberes v'hoga levlad kederech hanashim hamisbaisos tinu kabocha. She used to make poo 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 sounds to the baby when it cried, just like women do when a baby cries to get him to stop crying. So they called her Pua because she wanted the baby to be happy, right? So because of that, that's why they were called Shifra and Pua. That sounds pretty strange, right? I mean, the Torah, right, forever, the history of the world, tells us that this is their names because one of them used to clean the baby up and one of them used to talk nice to the baby so it wouldn't cry. Both so that the mother should have affection for the baby, right? When we're talking about women who saved the lives, right, that Paro wants them to kill the babies and they didn't kill the babies. So tell me, God says their name was Shifra and Pua because Shifra you know, saved their lives and Pua hid them, right? Whatever. But tell me, this, that's a real thing. That he, Paro wants you to murder these babies. You're putting your life on the line by not murdering the babies. So how does the Torah say that uh, who you are and, and, what, and what your reward is? is that you, got a, you didn't get a reward for saving the babies. You got a reward for making the baby look pretty and you got a reward for making the baby happy. That's what your reward's for. What about saving their lives, putting my life on the line? Paro's going to kill me if I don't do what he wants. Why, why? So that the answer is, is that that in, that the fact that they put their lives on the line is an important thing, and they receive reward for that. And the truth is, any one of us would have done the same thing, because you you're in a situation like that. You're going to say, "I'm not going to kill another person." If you think I'm going to kill another person, you better kill me, because I'm not going to do it. I, that's that's a Jewish response. We have mercy for people. We have rachamim. We're not going to. We are not going to do it. That's why in history, when you ever found a Jew who took the role of being a, an abuser, it was so odd, right? Like the kapos in the Holocaust. We look at that with such wonder how a person could do that, right? We don't look at the wonder how the Nazis could murder babies, but we look at wonder how a Jew could become um, a, you know, like the head of a group of Jews and abuse them for the Nazis in order to save his own life. That we don't understand. Why? Because we know any Jew is going to put his life on the line to help another Jew. But they went beyond that. They didn't say, it's enough already. What are you bothering me? I'm putting my life on my line to save your baby. You want me to make him look clean? You want me to make him stop crying? The point is that they didn't have to be asked. They, they knew they were going to put their lives on the line, but they wanted to go beyond that. They wanted that the mother should love the babies. They went through, the mother just went through a hard time. They wanted the baby should be pretty. The baby should be happy because they cared about the people. It wasn't just that they did that, that uh, saving their lives, but they went beyond it. They wanted more. They wanted to do more. And because of that, they're named for doing that. They weren't named as savior and helper. They were named the one who makes the baby pretty and the one who makes the baby happy. And, and because of it, it says in the next line now, it says... God benefited the midwives and the people increased and became very strong and it was because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. Now it says God, God paid, right, paid them, so to speak, right, spiritual payment. What was it? That there were a lot of Jewish people born and they became strong because they saved their lives and because they feared God, God made them houses. Like what does that mean? He made them houses. He built them a house. Like what do they do? Go hire like, you know, Mayfair homes and build them a house? That's not what it means. It means that he made houses like, like you know, we have the expression in, in designers. There's the house of Chanel. It doesn't mean it's house. It means, right? It's uh, in that case, a house has an understanding of a certain thing, right? In their case, it means like a movement, a group who work together to design clothes. And in this case, a house is talking about an important part of the Jewish people. And what were they? So Rashi tells us, what is it? He asked the but he made him houses, bate kuhuna velavia. He made for them the, the house, or the whole idea of the Kohanim and the Levium. Why? Because Yocheved, she's the mother of Aaron, who was the first Kohen Gadol. He was the head, right? All the Kohanim come from Aaron. That means they all come from Yocheved. Miriam, right, the sister, she was, she was a part of the family as well. She was a Levi, right? Because her father was a Levi. Her grandfather was Levi, Levi himself. She was a Levi, so for everyone that came from her was a Levi. So the house of Levi, the house of Kohen, came from them. Right? The houses of the people who are going to work towards 
towards helping the Jewish people build a relationship with God came from these two women who helped the, the Jewish women love their children, right, care for their children. That's really what we have here. So that's why they were called that. Just to give you a bit of a different meaning. Um, now we have, um, beginning in section 2, on page 296 and 97, section 2, it says, a man went from the house of Levi and he took a daughter of Levi. Now this is actually going back in time. What we just read actually happened after this. Why? Because it's telling you now about the marriage of Yocheved, who already in the story that we read a, a few minutes ago, moments ago, had a daughter, right? She had Miriam, who's the sister of Moshe and Aaron. So now it's telling you about their marriage, like it's bringing you back. So it says, so a man from the house of Levi took a daughter of Levi. So here's a man who's a grandson of Levi. He married his aunt, right? The daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was good and she hid him for three months. That was Moshe. Right? As we read on, you'll see that's Moshe. The fact is, is that it's very interesting that, if, that what we hear here, the Torah doesn't tell us who the parents are. It just tells us you have a grandson of Levi marrying a daughter of Levi, which means a man married his aunt. If you read the Torah, you're not allowed to marry your aunt. Right? It's forbidden. Um, I, I could not marry my aunt. It's, I can't marry my sister. I can't marry my mother. I can't marry my aunt. There are certain people you can't marry. There's seven levels of of, of family members that is incestuous, you're not allowed to marry. One of them is your aunt. And here you have the Amram, who is the head of the Jewish people, marrying his aunt. Not only that, who does he have for children? He has Miriam, Aaron, and Moshe, some of the most illustrious children. If the Torah had been given, his children would be mamzers. They would be outcasts. So yet here are the greatest people. So one thing that is for, uh, the first thing is the Torah wasn't given yet. So this law didn't apply, right? The law only applies when it's given. It hasn't been done. If we, you know, if the government makes a law that you can't drive more than 10 kilometers an hour, and uh, and that uh, law comes in, in, in uh, say, in a month, and you drive 20 kilometers an hour, and you get, someone stops you, they can't give you a ticket. It hasn't started yet, right? Here also, the Torah hasn't given that rule yet, so they they didn't do anything wrong. But it does show you an interesting thing. We find with almost every one of our great leaders that they did. They, there was some sort of odd thing about their birth something that wasn't perfect. In other words, they didn't all come from perfect, what, it, what we would think today are perfect families. That, you know, we want, to, we want our children to get married, we want to investigate the family, make sure they're perfect. They never went bankrupt, they never hurt anybody, they never did this, they never did that. They're good people. We want our, our, our son or daughter to marry into such a family. Here you see that the greatest people in Jewish history, all of them had something odd. Here we see Moses' parents, right? Even though the Torah wasn't given, you had that. You have Yaakov marrying two sisters, Right? All of the Jews came from them. You have Yehuda having this odd relationship with his daughter-in-law, who he thinks is a prostitute. Right? We read about that a few weeks ago. And, and comes from them Peretz, right? and from them comes, sure. comes Rus, and, and, comes, um, what do you call it? and comes Boaz, and, and from that comes Mashiach. So Mashiach has a funny background. You find time and time again that there's these things. And it comes to tell us that really the... The Jewish people, you know, we understand there's such a thing called yichas. There's having a good background, good ancestry. That you know, your parents were good people, your grandparents were good people. But the fact is that that while that's important, that's not everything, right? The, like they tell a story about the um, the Magid of Mezrich, who was the second leader of the Hasidic movement after the Baal Shem Tov, and that the Magid came from a family that had a lot of rabbis in it. One day he comes home from yeshiva and his mother's sitting at the door, uh, outside on the steps of his house, which is burnt down, and she's crying. And he says, you know, the house is burnt down, but, but you know, we'll rebuild it, we'll be able to do it. Why are you crying? She says, I'm not crying about the house. I'm not crying about it as long as I'm crying because inside the house was the only document I had that showed our family tree. And all of the great people that were in our family, it's all destroyed. I don't even remember it all. That paper's gone. So he looks at her, he's a young boy, and he says, you don't worry, the, the yichus, the ancestry, will come from me. Right? And it did. Today, anybody who was related to him is very proud that they were related to him. He was an amazing person. The point is, is that we all, all know that our backgrounds are important, but, the, but it doesn't mean you can't be great. You can be great, no matter who you are. No matter what your background was like, you can become great if you work at yourself and you want to be great. And our children can become great. It makes no difference if your family is religious, it wasn't religious, it just became religious, how knowledgeable you are. The fact is, if you want to do the will of God, you want to become close to God, you want to have 
children who do the same, it makes no difference what kind of family you have. So when people say to me, like, what can I, what, what can I want? I'm a Balshuva. What can I want? I'm a convert. What can I want? My mother, my father wasn't Jewish. The fact is, you can do anything. It makes no difference. You can do that. And that's what a story like this tells us, and all the other stories are the same message. So then, what do we have here? Is we have the story that, so he marries her, and she gets pregnant with Moshe, and she's born, and now she's afraid that they're going to kill him, because Pharaoh makes a new rule now. He's going to kill all sons, not just abort them, but kill them. So now she has a baby, and they're afraid that Pharaoh's going to kill him, so she puts him in a basket, right, puts him in the river, and off he goes. And his sister is hiding on the banks of the river, watching what happens. But there's nothing they can do. The baby, you know, that, that he's going to be killed. If, they, if he gets discovered, he's going to be killed. So they send him off. And, and then the story tells us that uh, Pharaoh's daughter goes down to the river, and she's um, bathing. And they see the baby there, right? And it says she took the baby home, and she raised him as her own child, and she hi had to hire a wet nurse. Right? They didn't have formula. And she was, of course, couldn't nurse him because she hadn't, she wasn't her child. So she ended up hiring Moshe's mother without realizing it. His actual mother was his wet nurse. Um, but here she now takes this baby home. Right? She saves his life. She takes him home. And, and it says that she calls him Moses. And why? She called him that because she drew him from the water. And the, the word Moshisiho, uh, Moshisiho, I'm sorry, I'm just not reading it well. Moshisiho, is that means he was drawn from Moshe, Moshe Sihu, is the same word. So that Moshe is known, his name is Moshe, because she saved his life by taking him out of the river. And that was his name. Um, and the fact is that um, he had a different name. His mother had, we say there's many names that he had, that his mother gave him, but then this one is the one that stuck. And we say, that's a funny thing. Here's the savior of the Jewish people, the most amazing human being in the world, Moshe, right? Goes up to heaven to get the Torah. Right? And, and of all the names, they give him, they give him an Egyptian name. It's not even a Hebrew name. Like his name, his name they, everyone called him Moshe. Like they should have called him Tuvia, which is one of the names his mother gave him. A name, a Jewish name. And here you have the, like the greatest man. Right? Every, how many people are named Moshe today? Everybody's got named Moshe. Somebody's got Moshe in their family. And yet, the, and, and that wasn't even it. And the point was is that, that you know, we have to realize Moshe was raised in the castle. He was in the, in the palace of the king, of Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't realize that his greatest enemy is living in his own house. Eventually, this is the man who's going to take him down. This baby that he lets into his house, that he raises his house. So Moshe is the prince. He's the prince of Egypt. He looks like an Egyptian. He's raised by the Egyptians. He has the power of the prince. He can kill people. He can do whatever he wants. He can be arrogant. I, I mean, you can imagine a person with total power, total authority, doesn't follow any rules. He's going to be an arrogant pain in the neck, right? That's what Moshe could be. So his, his mother gave him the name Moshe, that, that you were drawn from the water, to teach him the importance of appreciation. That he had that name stuck with him his whole life because it was a message she wanted him to have, that you need to appreciate what you have. You can't become arrogant. You can't become callous. You can't become uncaring. You must remember where you came from. So he remembered that he came from the Jewish people because his mother nursed him and he remembered to be appreciative of what he had in his life because of what, what his, his adopted mother, the daughter of Pharaoh, did for him. She eventually converted to Judaism and, and as remembered as a great person. And she, she saved his life. So that's why we use his name, so that he should always remember the importance of appreciation and never become such an arrogant person. And we see very soon that, on the next page already here on 298.99, beginning with the third Aliyah, it says that you know in those days Moshe grew up and he went out to his brethren. Moshe grew up, grew up. Here he is living in the castle. Right? He's got all the Nintendo games, everything he wants. And what does he do? He goes out and he walks around the slaves. He wants to hang out with the Jews. Right? Imagine, Pharaoh must be going crazy. Here's the prince of Egypt and he's hanging around with Jewish slaves. What's he doing? Like standing on the corner smoking cigarettes with them. He couldn't believe it. Well, Moshe does it because he feels drawn to the Jews because he's from them and he knows that he's from them. His mother taught him that and his, and, his, and his adopted mother taught him appreciation. So he appreciates his Jewish brothers and he sees what's happening to them. They're being, they're, they're being persecuted. They're being beaten and right? that's what happens. So it says that he goes out, he sees what happens to them and he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man. As though he turns this way and that way, he saw no one was looking and he struck down the Egyptian and he killed him and he buried him. Now this was the last act that Moshe could do because here he is 
you know, Pharaoh is taking him as his own son within his house, and and he says, I'm going to forget that you're Jewish. You're my son, and you're going to be one of us. And what does he do? He goes out there and he kills an Egyptian officer. It's like a policeman. He goes out and he kills an Egyptian policeman for hitting a Jew. Right? The, that, that's about the worst thing that this guy, Moshe could do. Moshe defends the Jews, which is because he feels like he feels like a Jew. But he kills a, a representative of the government and he buries him in the sand. Now Moshe knows he's got to get out of there because if he doesn't, yeah, he's going to have a problem. So it says he looks this way and he looks that way. Right? And if he looks around, you see nobody's watching. And then he physically kills him and buries him in the sand. So the Medrash explains that really he did more than that. He actually looks this way and that way means that he looks into the future and he says, does anything good come from this Egyptian? Here this Egyptian is hurting this Jew, but if I do something to him, kill him, the, his future is gone. Maybe in the future he's going to have children who are good people. So he looks prophetically into the future and he sees, no, nope, nothing's come from this man. So it says that he used the name of God that there's the powerful names of God that we don't know today. And he used one, and it caused the Egyptian to die, and he buried him. Um, that's what the, how the metric explains it. But even the simple level is that he looks, no one's looking, and he kills him because he wanted to t- take him out. How, how He couldn't allow this person to abuse one of his brothers as he saw him. And then what happens is, the next day, Moshe goes and he sees that a, um, two Jews fighting with each other. And that's a problem, right? That's, how, how can that be? They're my brothers. How can they fight with each other? How do two brothers fight? So he goes over to stop them, right? And one of them says to him, what are you going to do? What do you think? You're a big shot. You're just another Jew just like us. You, you live in the Pharaoh's house. You wear the fancy clothes. You're just like us. You, you're not my judge. Hey, what are you going to do? You want to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? So Moshe realizes, you know what? Someone saw. I killed the Egyptian. Right? This guy is already angry at me, and he's already threatening me with it. He says, so Moshe says, i got to leave. And he ran away. He left the country. At that point, he leaves the country because he knows if he stays there, Pharaoh's going to hear about it and Pharaoh's going to kill him. So he runs away and he goes off to Midian. And here in Midian, he's a, he, we see that he's an Egyptian. He, he looks like an Egyptian. And he gets taken into a, a house of Yisro where he eventually meets his wife, who's one of his daughters. And we have the story... Um, coming on the next page, which we'll go into for a little bit, of the burning bush. So here you have Moshe for all of these years, right, is living, and he is living in um, in Midian, and he's a shepherd. It's sort of like he gave up hope. He's a fugitive. He can't go back. Whatever good he's going to do to the Jewish people is finished. Now he's just sitting up on a mountain watching sheep. Right? This great man is now, that's what he's stuck with, because he killed somebody yeah, he, he took a turn for the worst. Now he can't go back and do anything. He can't go back to Egypt. They'll kill him. Um, but God doesn't accept, think that. The God doesn't accept that. So it says that here, beginning with number three, Moshe was shepherding the sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He guided the sheep into the wilderness as he arrived at the mountain of God towards Horeb. An angel of Hashem appeared to him in a blaze of fire from amid the bush. He saw, and behold, the bush was burning in the fire, but the bush was not consumed. Moshe thought, I'll turn aside now and look at this great sight. Why will the bush not be burnt? Hashem saw that he turned aside and God calls out to him and he says, you know, Moshe, here I am, and so forth. So here we have Moshe is a shepherd. He's walking through, you know, like this uh, sort of wild area looking for a lost sheep. And he sees a burning bush. He sees, now you understand what a burning bush is. He sees a bush on fire, right? But as the fire is there, the bush is not burning up. So you have this, it's like, imagine if someone would take a rose and light it on fire. So it would consume the, the rose, the, the, the petals, everything, right? You'd have less like a black stick, right? So, so here you have a rose on fire, and it's on fire, but it's not burning. So, something's burning, but the rose is not burning. And most is amazed by this. How could it be that, that a bush is burning, but yet it's not burning at the same time? There's a fire coming out of it, but it's all still there. Nothing's being consumed. That in order for a fire to work, it has to eat something. It has to destroy something, right? In order for it to burn. So he doesn't understand that. So it says that. So um, Moses thought, "I'll turn aside now and look at this great sight. Why the bush would not be burned?" So Moses sees it. He says, "This is weird. How can you have a bush that's not burning?" So now I'm going to look back at it and I'm going to wonder why that happened, right? When he does that, it says Hashem saw him do this and he calls out to him. That is to say that God saw Moshe stop right, and look at the bush and he says, now that's my man. 
the man who stops to look at this bush, that's going to be the leader of the Jewish people to save the Jewish people. So he calls out to him and says, Moshe, you got to go to Egypt and get the Jews. Right? What did he do? You imagine you and I are standing, in, standing outside and we see a tree across the street on fire and it's not burning. There's a fire and it's, and it's not burning. So we'd stop and look at it. So does that mean you're going to be a great Jewish leader? What, what does that mean? It means you saw something really weird and you wanted to look at it, right? So why does God consider that to be the sign that Moshe is the right person? That, that he stopped and he looked at it, so God spoke to him. Uh, any one of us would stop to look at it. Anybody, a dog would stop to look at it. Like, anyone would look at it. Why, why is it special? Well, the point is, is that the Medrash tells us that Moshe was thinking something much deeper. Moshe was, saw the fire and he saw that it wasn't burning the bush. He said to himself, the Jewish people are on fire. They're being destroyed. The Egyptians are destroying them. They're, they made them into slaves. They're taking away their families. They're taking away everything. They're, they're making them poor and work terribly. They, they're destroying the Jewish people. But, and yet they're not being destroyed. They're still the Jewish people. They're still ethical. They still care. They're still learning Torah. They're still growing. They're not being destroyed. It's not happening. But they keep trying. And the more they try, the stronger the Jewish people get. That's like the bush. The more it burns, the less that burns of it. That, so when Moshe looked at the bush, he thought of the Jewish people. And God says that, it, that he's been away for all these years, and he sees this amazing thing, and the first thing he thinks of is the Jewish people. That's my leader. If you want to be a Jewish leader, you have to care about the Jewish people. Now you have to want a job as a leader. Now you, have, you want to make money as a leader. You have to care about the Jewish people. Like I, I do all the time. If, you know, you can have rabbis who are great scholars, who are unbelievable speakers, but if that rabbi doesn't care for the members of his community, he's not going to be successful. An only person, and it's not just a rabbi, it's a parent, it's a teacher, whoever it is, if you're in a role of leadership, you have to care for the people you're leading. If you don't care, and you don't let them know that you care, you're going to fail. Because that is the number one rule of leadership. You have to care for the people that you're leading. If you don't care, if it's just a job, it's not going to work. And so God said, here's this Moshe, he's away for all of these years from Egypt. He has nothing to do with the Jewish people. He's away. He's sitting, being a shepherd. He can have a very nice life. He'll make money. He'll live here as a shepherd. He'll have his wife and his children, and he'll have a nice life. What does he need anymore? And Moshe says, no. The first thing Moshe does is he's thinking all the time about the Jewish people, what's happening to them. I can't go back, but I wish I could help them. And he looks at the burning bush, and he says, look at that. The more they try to hurt the Jewish people, the stronger they are. That's what he sees in the bush. He doesn't see an amazing thing. He sees that. God says, that's my man. That's why he says, when God saw him turn back and look at it, he knew that that was the right one. And that's because that is the first rule. And so he says, Moshe, Moshe, Moshe says, here I am. He says, don't come closer, but take your shoes off your feet, because you're standing on holy ground. And then he introduces himself to him and tells him you have to go take the, the people, out, the Jews out of Egypt and bring them back to, to the land of Israel. Um, it takes a, you know, a bit to say that. Now, the, um, the first thing is the uh, idea of him telling him, this is the holy ground, take off your shoes. What, what does that mean? Like, take, yeah, you go to shul, you don't take your shoes off. Right? You go to a Torah class, you don't take your shoes off. You, you didn't take your shoes off to come here. So why does he tell him to take his shoes off? You don't find that anywhere. So this is a, uh, this is a bit esoteric and a bit subtle, but it's a, an important idea. You know, there's a medrash that says that Adam, the first man, his skin was made out of fingernails. That's what they say, our skin is made out of skin. His was made out of fingernails. You say, well, what does that mean? So the Medrash very rarely, if ever, should be taken literally. What the Medrash is telling us here is that that you have fingernails, right? So what are the purposes of your fingernails? They're really to guard your finger from getting hurt. You want to pull that on something, you want to pull a staple out, you want to pull on a nail, you want to hit something. Your fingernails are guard your fingers. So they don't, they, they don't get hurt. You can do certain things you couldn't do without them, right? So your fingernails are what your fingers use, right, for, as a tool. It's a tool for your fingers. But it's not you. You can cut it. You can cut your fingernails. It doesn't hurt you. The only time cutting your fingernails will hurt you is if you actually cut your skin. But cutting your fingernails doesn't hurt. It's not really you. It's, it's no longer a part of you. But it's there as a tool to help you, right? It's the same thing as shoes. When you walk through the world, right, yeah, you can hurt your feet. 
You can step on glass, you can step on stones, you can step on hot things, cold things. So you put on shoes so that you can go out and do things. Right? But the shoes aren't a part of you. Right? Yeah. If you tear your shoe, it doesn't hurt you. Right? It's just like your fingernails. But it's a tool that you use to go through the world. So when it says that Adam's skin was like fingernails, it's because Adam identified himself as a soul. When Adam's stomach would hurt, he wouldn't say, my, uh, I, I'm in pain. He'd say, my body hurts. Because he saw himself as a soul. He was a soul wearing a body. The body is here to help me live in this world so I can get go places. My soul can't walk. I need legs. My soul can't touch things. I need hands. So it needed a body. So, his soul, the body was to the soul what shoes are to your feet or what your fingernails are to your fingers. So, so the Medjus says, Adam's fing- body was made out of fingernails because his body was to him like our fingernails are to us. It wasn't really made out of fingernails. It was, the same, it was that message, right? That his body is not who he is. His soul is who he is. We are not like that. We say, when your stomach hurts, you say, I'm in pain, right? Not, not my body is in pain. I'm in pain because we see ourselves as one. God was saying this message to Moshe. Take your shoes off in this place. Understand the concept that your body and your soul right, are, are, have very specific purposes. Your soul is why you're here in this world, that you're neshama. But you need a body in order to do things. You can't shake a lulav without arms. You can't eat matzah without a mouth. So I gave you a body to do the mitzvahs and to live your life, but you're, you are your soul. When you're going to a place where God reveals himself, Right, God, God's telling Moshe, expose your soul to me. Open your soul to me. And that's what I, so take off your shoes is a symbol of that. Just like the skin of Moshe, of, of Adam, was fingernails, because the skin was like his shoes, because it wasn't him. Right? We, our body is who we are, so we wear shoes to take care of us, which is our body. So that's the idea. So he took off his shoes for that reason, because it was holy ground. And then he tells them, I'm the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? and I, 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 and, and I, I want to take you back to the land of Israel, and I need you to do it. Right? And he gives them a, a way to prove it, and so forth. And, um, and we'll, we'll close with this thought, is that Moshe, in the end, um, doesn't want to go. Not because he doesn't want to go. Moshe is a born leader. We see it from how he was as a child. But he does. He goes among the Jews. He cares about them. He kills somebody for the sake of another person. That's a leader. That's a Jew. He, there's no question he knew who he was. But he doesn't want to do it. Because he feels that because he can't speak well, he has a speech impediment, that he's not going to be successful. No one's going to listen to him. And he says, there's so many other people who are better than me. I mean, really, Aaron, my brother. Aaron, right, my older brother, would be much better at this than me. But, but get him to do it. He's a speaker. People like him. He's got a good personality. Send him. And he and the mentor says that he's picked every single person in the world he went through. Every single person. He said, this person, they'd be better than me. This is why. This one, they'd be better than me. This is why. And God discounted them all and said that you're the one. The way that he knew that Moshe was the one was because he looked back at the bush. Because when he looked back at the bush, he wasn't looking at the bush. He was thinking about the Jewish people. That's how he knew. So the ultimate leader of the Jewish people had to be the shepherd for the Jewish people, the one who took care of the Jewish people, who cared about them. Then you'll be successful. And God tells him, what are you worried about? I'm, I, I'm the one who gave the speech impediment. I'm the one who can make you the speaker. Don't worry about it. And then he says that they'll finally they'll they'll listen to you. Um, and if, of course, God gives him the staff. And the, uh, the staff, right, that he throws to the ground turns into a snake right, that we read about later on as well. So the staff, the Medrash says, was created at the moments before the seventh day of creation. Right? You know, the seventh day of creation is Shabbos. So you can't, there's no creation anymore. It was done. So the last few, this is a couple of things were done right in the last moments, like as the sun was setting on Friday night. And one of the things that God created was the staff, this walking stick. Because it was supposed to be a, a wondrous wonder stick, the stick that was created as Shabbos was about to begin. So it was more than just a stick. So as you see, he threw it down, it turns into a snake. It was a stick that had special holiness to it. So that's what he was giving him. So God says what to him, what's in your hand? Moses says a staff. Throw it down, it becomes a snake. Reach out your hand, grab his tail, it turns back into a staff. So he says, it's not a magic stick. I'm doing this, God's doing it. You're gonna use this as a tool that people will believe you. And he sends him 
to go, right? And as I said, he goes through all of these different people that they should go instead of me, and God tells him, no, you are the one that's going to go. Okay, I'm uh, we'll just uh, do uh, one more thing. So, so we have at the end of the Parsha, rather than going through it in detail, that Moshe does go and confront Pharaoh, right? He actually goes and uh, and he meets Pharaoh, and he fails horribly. Pharaoh, he tells Pharaoh, let the people go. He says, who are you? Who are you to tell me what to do? You're some little kid I let into my house. Right? And then you're so ungracious, you ran away. You murdered one of my people and you run away, I should kill you. Who are you to tell me what to do? So he tells him, God, God sent me. He says, then who's your God? Who's, what do you mean God? One God. I have a book of gods right here. I look through it, there's no God by your name in here. So you're a nobody and your God is a nobody. Get out of here. And he says, I'm going to show you. And he makes the life of the Jews worse. He takes away their straw from making the bricks. Right? And he says, now get out of here before I really do something bad. And now the, now, Pharaoh's mad at him and the Jews are mad at him. Because now the Jews, before it was bad enough, they had, to make, they had to make bricks all day. Now they have to make bricks and they don't have any straw. They have to find a way of doing it without the tools. Right? Now they, this, this is how you save us, Moshe? You're right. This is what you do. You, you, you're, you're, you know, you're this privileged guy who lives in the king's castle. You run away. You show up, and what do you do? You make trouble for us. You come here, and we should leave. We're, don't be so quick that we should leave. When God wants us to leave, He'll take us out. Who are you to do this? And you failed, and now life's worse for us. And that ends it. Right? That ends it. And God goes. And he goes to God, and He says, "Look, God, look what you did to me. You, I was a nice, nice guy living out in Midian." being a shepherd, and you, know, you make me come back against my wishes, you tell me to take the Jews out, I go to take the Jews out, and I, I fail. And the Jews are worse off. So God, so God closes it by saying, now, you're going to go back, and now you will see what I shall do to Pharaoh, for through a strong hand will he send them out, with a strong hand he will drive them from his land. In the end, Pharaoh will make the Jews leave, because you know, God's setting it up. Right? In other words, he's telling Moshe, be patient. Right? Game's not over. You might, uh, you might think you lost the battle, but the war is far from being over because this is all part of my plan. And it leaves you with this feeling that you have to look at it from Moses' point of view. Even though he's this, you know, you can imagine he's raised his royalty, he's a regal person, you know, a person who's, well, who's raised well, who's very wealthy. You can see it in them, right? They, they're taught, you know, they're educated, they have a certain formality, a certain politeness. Not everybody, but if somebody is taught that way, right, you see it. Moshe is like that. Right? And he goes off just to live a nice gentleman's life in the middle of nowhere. And God calls him to come back. So right, he calls him to come back and he makes everything worse. Right? And that ends the Parsha. Right? The situation for Moshe is, is horrible. He has to believe God, which he does, that things are going to get better. But everyone around me hates me. Pharaoh hates me and wants to kill me. You know, the Jews, they want to get rid of me because they think you know, I'm some, some guy who just comes in here because I, I got nothing to do. I'm going to come in and make trouble for them. So, like, what kind of a life is this for me? And that concludes it. And we, have, we then see how Moshe's personality comes through in the next few weeks and is able to raise, through the help of God, raise, raise the ante and, and get the Jews out. And it just shows you in an interesting way. Okay? Thank you. Moses' children, his wife wasn't Jewish. Were they great? Well, firstly, at this point, nobody is Jewish, right? Okay. Until the Torah is given. And then when the Torah is given, there's a, that created a mass conversion. So every person who was um, considered a Hebrew, which also Moshe's wife and children would be by marrying into the people, um, would became Jewish. So they were. But Moshe's children did not become great. And there's a, there's a whole lesson to be learned from that. In fact, it says that one of his grandchildren in the book of, um, the, in the book of Shoftim, it says one of his grandchildren was the head of an idol worshiper. Right, his own grandson. Um, and they say it's, that, that we can allude to a lot of reasons that why a leader often has to neglect their family and his family sometimes pays the price. Right? But there are many lessons that we can learn from it. But they were Jewish. They said they, um, but they were Jewish like everyone else at that point. Like, there were those who came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob directly. And then there were those who became a part. But as long as when the Torah was given, whoever was a part of the Jewish people then became Jewish. And, and, then, and they were the original Jews. From that point on, you either were born into that group or you converted. But up until that point, you simply had to just go there and be one of them and you converted on that day. Okay? Thank you, sir. Yes.